It was truly a wondrous time in the colony of Massachusetts during the middle to late 1730s. It appeared to me and to others who were receptive to the presence of the Holy Spirit that there was a profound and glorious kindling of religious passion. In my research I received word and documented in my faithful narrative some 32 communities reporting movements of the Holy Spirit result in renewals of passion for our Lord as well as new and genuine commitments to the saving grace of Christ. The fire of the word seemed to spread and take hold of hearts in such a manner that is yet to be seen here in this country. I was humbled to have been privy to such a dispensation of God's favor and sought to take account of these occurrences, as well as to offer some reasoned defense of these transformations. As I wrote in my faithful narrative, God has so seemed to have gone out of his usual way in the quickness of his work and the swift progress his spirit has made in his operations on the hearts of many. It is wonderful that persons should be so suddenly and yet so greatly changed. Many have been taken from loose and careless living and seized with strong convictions of their guilt and misery, and in very little time old things have passed away, and all things have become new with them. God's work has also appeared very extraordinary in the degrees of his influence, in the degrees both of awakening and conviction, and also of saving light, love, and joy that many have experienced. It has also been very extraordinary in the extent of it, and its being so swiftly propagated from town to town. In former times of the outpouring of the Spirit of God on this town, though in some of them it was very remarkable, it reached no further then. The neighboring towns all around continued unmoved. I myself remember a most blessed visit by the revered Mr. George Whitfield, the greatest preacher of the Northampton Revival. His disposition displayed such humility, yet there was coursing through him a vibrant energy that could be mistaken for nothing but zeal for the gospel and the saving of souls. He stayed in our home and rejuvenated the spirit of myself and Sarah and our children with his exuberance and joy. And when he spoke to the throng that had gathered to feast on his words, I myself was overcome with emotion, till the tears ran down my face, and I was affirmed again that our Lord has given us both our reason and our hearts, so that we may know his grace, truly know it, so that when the psalmist declares, Taste and see that the Lord is good, we would understand his meaning not just in the rightness of our mind, but in the very richness of our bodies. It was this connection, the heart and the mind, I believe, that so moved the Massachusetts people and resulted in such an explosion of conversion in the colony as is yet to be seen anywhere. To attend a revival meeting was quite a remarkable event, and one that has brokered much debate, to which I will turn shortly. However, to hear the impassioned proclamations of one such as Whitfield would cause even the stoniest of faces to soften and unloose the tears of contrition. While many wept and rejoiced, others were physically taken over, it would seem, and it is my hope, by the power of the Word and the Spirit, such that some questions arose as whether this was truly the work of God or the triumph of Satan seen in enthusiasm and hysteria. Truly, I tell you, it is only by the fruit that might come of these experiences that we could ever know the quality of their conviction. Such is the mystery of God that the shedding of a single tear might reflect the movement of mountains, while one appearing to be completely overcome may nonetheless have their hearts affected, not one iota. How can we, as faithful ministers in the discipleship of the flock, possibly discern the difference? Concern about enthusiasm has caused many to question the legitimacy of the movement of the Spirit of God in Northampton. Critics have suggested that the dramatic effect upon the bodies, or the ardent emotions that seem to overcome others, or even the rash behaviors and throwing off of established conventions of gender and race, are signs that this is a work of the devil not of God. While this may be true in some instances, I believe it illogical and rash to assume that the hysteria of some reflects the absence of God's presence and action. I've personally seen the effect that can occur on one so seized by the knowledge and spirit of God in both fear and joy that the body cannot but be similarly affected. One example, a young woman by the name of Abigail Hutchinson, had nothing in her character or upbringing to suggest such hysterics or proneness to exuberance as Mr. Chauncey might contend. However, after becoming acquainted with a great envy in her soul at the profound spiritual transformation of another young woman, she came to full awareness of her own sinfulness and wickedness of heart. She was overcome. Here I will recount the experience from my faithful narrative. This came upon her, as she expressed it, as a flash of lightning and struck her into an exceeding terror, upon which she left off reading the Bible in course, as she had begun, and turned to the New Testament to see if she could not find some relief there for her distressed soul. Her great terror, she said, was that she had sinned against God. Her distress grew more and more for three days until she saw nothing but blackness of darkness before her, and her very flesh trembled for fear of God's wrath. 
She wondered and was astonished at herself that she had been so concerned for her body, and had applied so often to physicians to heal that, and yet had neglected her soul. And now we see this effect upon both the body and the mind as one encounters the Spirit of God. It was the manner of over a week that she experienced these sensations rooted in her dread and conviction. However, after participating in the Sabbath and experiencing the blessed hope that is offered in the Gospel message, she did come to a renewed peace and joy, and out of this joy was a fire to save others from the fear of hell that she so powerfully experienced. And yet, before I seem too naive and unsophisticated in mine own acceptance of the great spiritual awakening that has come upon the area, I must in fact agree with the critics that a soberness of mind and character is to be observed. The deceiver is wily and astute, such that persons outside the embrace of our Lord are prone to his treachery. As stated above, I recognize that not all the experiences of those claiming an encounter with the grace of Jesus Christ are legitimate, and some may even have been induced by the desire to seem devout before their peers. Others may yet be sincere of mind and heart, yet guileless and easily led to rash judgment and sin in their action and earnestness to follow the command of Christ. One such case is Bathsheba Kingsley, who, upon being seized with a great zeal, stole a neighbor's horse and rode off without her husband's approval in order to minister to the outlying towns. After our council convened and judged her to be of sincere conviction, it was decided that she was simple of mind and susceptible to impulse. While some argue that this is evidence that this kind of enthusiasm for the gospel is dangerous and not becoming sound belief, I argue that it is not the validity of her conviction, but the shrewdness of her mind that is to be blamed. The responsibility of the community is not to dismiss her earnestness, but to nurture the development of temperance and wisdom. And so it has come to the place of dispute between those who are termed the new lights, those in favor of this emerging revivalism and affirmation of faith, and the old lights who seek to defend a more rational display rooted in the traditional church. These old lights also fear that the itinerant or lay preacher with a wild new theology is leading astray the naive, and that antinomianism, or rejection of the law, is being promoted. The Reverend Mr. Whitfield and myself, those who have been called the New Lights, because of our acceptance of the revival spirit and appreciation for the conversions occurring amongst the new or renewed faithful. The respectable Mr. Charles Chauncey and Mr. John Mayhew have represented the old light of persons concerned that the venerable institution of the church will be eroded due to an unchecked enthusiasm. They have sought to maintain the traditional church, perceiving that to allow this subjectivity of the congregants is to invite all manner of aberrations to the sanctity of Christ's body on earth. For the record, I too am concerned about lay preaching and the risk that those lacking discernment might be led astray. Additionally, I do not support a rejection of the law in emphasizing the importance of the heart in matters of true faith. I long only to impress the conviction that we must receive the transforming grace and love of Christ in the whole of our being, not just our mind, to be found true before our Lord. It has been my ambition to avoid the narrow and overly rational approach to faith. This is not to dispense with reason, the faculties of the mind, and the importance of will, which are indispensable to our Christian witness. However, I am attempting to assert that true faith cannot be true without an essential inclination of the heart, corresponding to the working out of reasoned belief. It is my conviction, supported by a wealth of our most esteemed scriptures, that it is, in a transformation of the heart, not merely a change of rational consideration, that faith is true. Even as I now am writing my treatise on the relationship between the intellect, the will, and the heart, it has become ever more evident that one must be affected in one's heart for their faith to be proved genuine. For the life to be transformed, the heart must respond to both the delight in the goodness of God and in the terror of His wrath. A rational mind might comprehend this idea, but a tender heart will have this truth completely alter their entire life. This is evident in the following passage of my book. Now by a hard heart is plainly meant an unaffected heart, or a heart not easy to be moved with virtuous affections, like a stone, insensible, stupid, unmoved, and hard to be impressed. Hence the hard heart is called a stony heart, and is opposed to a heart of flesh that has feeling and is sensibly touched and moved. We read in scripture of a hard heart and a tender heart, and doubtless we are to understand these as contrary to one another. But what is a tender heart? But a heart which is easily impressed by what ought to affect it. As the Lord is said to Josiah, Because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardst what I spake against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation, and a curse, and as rent thy clothes, and as wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. And this is one thing, wherein it is necessary we should become as little children, in order to our entering into the kingdom of God, even that we should have our hearts tender, 
and easily affected, and moved in spiritual and divine things as little children have in other things. Where, you might ask, has this attempt to bridge the distance between the heart, the will, and the intellect been shaped? My beliefs have been impacted considerably by many philosophers and theologians. In particular, the thinking of John Locke, who, albeit more radical in his philosophy than holy support, has convinced me of the validity of our sensory experience, as well as the objective position that we can take on our own sensory experience. Furthermore, Isaac Newton's articulation of an orderly universe has convinced me of the divine intent behind our very existence. As I've said elsewhere, one can know that honey is sweet. However, one must taste honey to understand and enjoy its sweetness. Our subjective encounter with the world and the necessity of a transformed heart, not just a transformed intellect and will, is necessary to living fully in the grace of Christ. Our reason allows us to consider, to test the spirits, if you will, of the experiences of our heart, but these should not override or disregard the impact of the spirit on our heart. We can neither appeal to strict rationality, as Chauncey would contend, nor can we give in to enthusiasm, but we must find some way to exist in the space between. It is my hope that you have seen the importance of renewals of faith and for the transformation of the heart, not just the intellect. In this way, we cannot dismiss the experiences of this great spiritual awakening right out, but we must reasonably consider that which the Holy Spirit has sought out to do, to conform each and every one of us into the hands and feet of Jesus Christ our Lord.